Hi, welcome back to another IB Environmental Systems and Societies video. Today, I'm going to take you through five real-world examples to help you understand fundamental versus realized niches. Let's get into it. When studying ecology, two big concepts help us understand where species live and why they live there. The fundamental niche and the realized niche. Think of the fundamental niche as a species theoretical home to all the places it could potentially live if nothing else got in its way. The realized niche, however, is where the species actually lives after accounting for all the real world limitations like competition and human activity. Let's go through five different examples from around the world. The first example is probably the most common one that you'll see, and that's barnacles on the Pacific coast of North America. There are two species we're concerned with, Cathalamus stellatus and Balanus balanoides. Both species could theoretically live anywhere in the intertidal zone. The intertidal zone is the zone along the coast between the mean low tide line and the average high tide line. That's their fundamental niche. However, in reality, they divide the space. The larger Balanus dominates the lower zones where it can physically crowd out the Cathalamus barnacles. But the Cathalamus barnacles survive by occupying the higher zones where it's better at handling the dry conditions because that's where land is exposed to air above the waterline for longer periods of time. Each species realized niche is just a portion of where it could potentially live. In the Arctic, we see a similar pattern with foxes. The red fox, Volpes volpes, and the Arctic fox, Volpes lagopes, could theoretically inhabit the entire Arctic region. That's their fundamental niche. But in reality, they divide the territory. The bigger red fox dominates the more productive southern regions, while the arctic foxes are pushed into the harsher northern areas. Their realized niches are determined by competition for prey, like lemmings and voles, and they also compete for den sites for breeding purposes. Moving to tropical coastlines, different mango species like Avicennia marina, Rhizophora mangle, and Brugera gymnoriza could potentially grow anywhere along the coast. Again, that's their fundamental niche. However, all three species compete for root space, light, and nutrients. And when you combine that with different tolerances for salt water, this creates distinct zones where each species is found. Each of these mangrove species realized niche is a specific band along the shoreline where it has competitive advantages over the other two species. Example four is the Andean condor. The Andean condor, Vulture griffis, presents an interesting case. Its fundamental niche includes any mountainous region with sufficient updrafts and food. However, its realized niche is much smaller. It's restricted to the highest parts of the Andes Mountains. This is due primarily to competition with other scavengers like the black vulture, which it competes for carry-on and nesting sites with. But the Andean condor also competes with people, mainly through habitat loss and persecution. When we say persecution, we mean that people hunt it. The fifth example is that of the giant panda in China. The giant panda, whose Latin name is Ilaropoda melanoleuca, could potentially inhabit any temperate forest with bamboo. That's its fundamental niche. But the panda's realized niche is limited to specific mountain ranges in central China. This is mainly due to human development in competition with livestock for space. But interestingly, competition with other wildlife is limited because the panda has such a specialized bamboo diet. In each of these cases, you can see how the realized niche is always smaller than the fundamental niche. Competition, whether with other species or with people, forces organisms to occupy only those areas where they have specific advantages over other species. I hope you found that helpful. Until next time, happy learning.